Every level of operating system evolution explained. Level 1. Bare Metal and Monitor Level. The Stone Age. Level 1. The Bare Metal Monitor Level. The absolute bottom of the barrel. This is computing in the 1950s, and it was brutal. No operating system as we know it today. Programs ran directly on the hardware with zero abstraction. If you wanted to run a program, you literally had to flip toggle switches on the front panel of the computer to input machine code. Not typing on a keyboard, physically flipping switches to represent ones and zeros. Here's how ridiculous this was. You'd write your program on paper, convert it to binary by hand, then stand in front of this massive machine flipping hundreds of switches in the correct sequence. One mistake, and you'd have to start over. Then you'd hit the run button and wait. If it worked, great. If it didn't, you'd have no idea why because there was no debugging. The monitor was just a tiny program that helped load jobs into memory. That's it. No multitasking, no user interface, no file system. One program ran at a time and the computer sat idle while you physically loaded the next one. Computers cost millions of dollars and spent most of their time doing nothing while humans fumbled with switches. Think about how inefficient this was. A computer that could execute millions of instructions per second was limited by how fast a human could flip switches. It's like owning a Ferrari, but only being able to drive by pushing it on foot. Level 1 represents the earliest mainframes, machines like the IBM 7090 that filled entire rooms. These weren't personal computers. They were institutional resources resources that required specialized training to operate, and the operating system was basically just a bootloader. If you think this is how computers still work, congratulations, you have level 1 understanding, you're stuck in 1955. Level 2. Batch Operating Systems. Slightly less terrible. Level 2. Batch Operating Systems. Still primitive, but at least we're making progress. Batch systems solved one major problem, the human bottleneck. Instead of having one programmer monopolize the computer flipping switches, operators would collect programs on punch cards, group them into batches, and feed them through sequentially. The computer would run job 1, finish, automatically load job 2, finish, load job 3, and so on. This was revolutionary for the 1960s. Now the computer could run for hours without human intervention. Programmers would submit their punch card decks in the morning, go do other work, and come back later to collect their output printouts. Turnaround time went from minutes to hours, but at least the expensive computer was actually being used efficiently. But here's what level 2 people don't understand. Batch systems had zero real-time interaction. You couldn't debug your code interactively. You couldn't see what was happening while your program ran. You just submitted your job and hoped it worked. If there was an error, you'd find out hours later when you got your printout. Then you'd have to fix the bug, resubmit, and wait hours again. The operating system in batch mode was still incredibly basic. It loaded jobs from tape or cards, executed them one at a time, wrote output, and moved to the next job. No concept of multiple users logged in simultaneously. No keyboard, no monitor, just card readers and printers. Systems like early IBM mainframes operated this way. OS 360 started as a batch system. You'd submit your COBOL or Fortran program, the system would compile and run it, and you'd get your results eventually. Level 2 understanding is knowing computers used to work in batches. But if you think that's where the story ends, you're missing the next five massive revolutions in computing. Level 3, Multi-Programming and Time-Sharing Systems. The real revolution. Level 3, Multi-Programming and Time-Sharing Systems. This is where operating systems got serious. The problem with batch systems was simple. When one program was waiting for input and output, the CPU sat idle. Disk and tape operations are incredibly slow compared to CPU speeds. So engineers had a brilliant idea. Keep multiple programs in memory at once. When program A is waiting for disk access, switch the CPU to program B. When B waits for I and O, switch to program C. Keep that expensive CPU busy constantly. This is multi-programming, and it changed everything. Suddenly, computer utilization jumped from maybe 30% to 80% or higher. The same hardware could do far more work. Operating systems became truly complex because they had to manage memory for multiple programs, schedule CPU time fairly, and prevent programs from interfering with each other. Then came time sharing, the next evolution. Instead of just running multiple batch jobs, what if multiple users could interact with the computer simultaneously? Time-sharing systems give each user a tiny slice of CPU time, maybe 100 milliseconds, then switch to the next user. The switching happens so fast it feels like you have the computer to yourself, even though 50 other users are logged in. This was revolutionary in the 1960s and 70s. Universities could finally give students direct access to computers. Programmers could debug code interactively, see immediate results, and iterate quickly. 
development speed increased dramatically. Systems like Multix, the predecessor to Unix, pioneered time sharing. Unix itself, created in 1969, was designed as a time sharing system from day one. Multiple users, multiple processes, protected memory, file systems with permissions. This is where modern operating system concepts were born. Level 3 people understand that operating systems manage resources and enable multiple programs to coexist, but they're still missing the user-focused evolutions that made computers accessible to regular people. Level 4, Multi-User and Multitasking OS, The Professional Era. Level 4, Multi-User and Multitasking Operating Systems. This is where OS design matured. By the 1970s and 80s, operating systems had to handle complex requirements. Many users logged in simultaneously, each running multiple programs, all with strong security boundaries. No user should be able to crash another user's program or access their files. The operating system became the referee ensuring everyone played fair. Unix became the gold standard. It introduced concepts we still use today. Hierarchical file systems, pipes for connecting programs, user permissions, and process isolation. A user's program ran in protected memory space separate from other users and from the kernel itself. If your program crashed, it didn't take down the whole system. Windows NT emerged in the early 1990s as Microsoft's answer to enterprise multi-user systems. Unlike DOS, which was single-user and single-tasking, NT could handle multiple users, preemptive multitasking, and proper security. VMS, the operating system for DEC mini-computers, set the standard for reliability and uptime. Level 4 systems introduced preemptive multitasking. Instead of programs voluntarily yielding CPU time, the operating system forcibly interrupts them on a schedule. This prevents one misbehaving program from hogging resources and freezing the entire system. The OS is in charge, not the applications. These systems also introduced sophisticated scheduling algorithms. Priority-based scheduling gave important tasks more CPU time. Fair scheduling ensured no user was starved of resources. Real-time variants guaranteed critical tasks would execute within strict time limits. But here's where level 4 fall short. These were systems for professionals, programmers, scientists, businesses. Normal people still couldn't use computers because everything was command line based. You needed technical knowledge just to navigate the file system. The next revolution would fix that. Level 5. Graphical and Desktop OS. The Consumer Revolution. Level 5. Graphical and Desktop Operating Systems. This is where computers became consumer products. The command line was powerful but intimidating. Most people couldn't remember arcane commands or navigate directory structures with text. The graphical user interface changed everything. Instead of typing commands, you point and click. Files are represented as icons you can drag and drop. Applications have windows, menus, and buttons. Mac OS pioneered this for consumers starting in 1984. Then Windows 3.1 in 1992 and Windows 95 in 1995 brought GU eyes to the masses. Suddenly, your grandmother could use a computer. Linux desktops like KDE and GNOME emerged in the late 1990s, bringing open-source GUI systems to the table. These operating systems introduced the desktop metaphor. Your screen is a desk. Files are documents on that desk. The trash can is where you throw things away. It's intuitive because it mirrors real-world objects. This made computers accessible to billions of people who would never learn command-line syntax. Level 5 systems also refined multitasking for regular users. You could have Word open while listening to music while downloading files while browsing the web. The operating system managed all these tasks seamlessly in the background. Plug-and-play hardware meant you could connect a printer or mouse, and it just worked. But there's a limitation here. Desktop operating systems assumed you were sitting at a desk with a keyboard, mouse, and monitor plugged into wall power. The next level would challenge all those assumptions. Level 6. Mobile and Embedded OS. The Portable Era. Level 6. Mobile and Embedded Operating Systems. This is where computing went everywhere. Mobile OS design is completely different from desktop. You're running on battery power, so aggressive power management is critical. The screen is tiny, so the interface has to be touch optimized. The hardware is limited, so efficiency matters more than raw power. And security is paramount because your phone contains your entire digital life. iOS launched in 2007 and Android in 2008, defining the modern mobile era. These systems introduced touch-first interfaces with gestures like swipe, pinch, and tap. Apps were sandboxed 
unboxed for security, meaning each app runs in isolation and can't access another app's data without permission. Background task management is aggressive, killing apps to save battery. Embedded operating systems power everything from smart thermostats to car computers to industrial machinery. Real-time operating systems, RTOS, guarantee tasks, execute within precise time windows. If your car's anti-lock brakes run on an RTOS, the system guarantees the braking calculation completes in microseconds every single time, or people die. Embedded Linux variants run on billions of devices. They're stripped down, optimized for specific hardware, and designed to run for years without rebooting. Your Wi-Fi router, smart TV, and home security system probably run embedded Linux. Level 6 systems introduced context awareness. Your phone knows your location, orientation, ambient light level, and motion. The OS adapts accordingly, rotating the screen, dimming the display, or activating different features based on context. But even mobile systems have limitations. They're designed for single users on single devices. The final level breaks even that constraint. Level 7, Cloud and Virtualized OS, GOAT tier. Level 7, Cloud and Virtualized Operating Systems, GOAT status, the absolute pinnacle of OS evolution. This level isn't about one computer anymore. It's about operating systems that span thousands of machines across multiple data centers. Chrome OS barely runs anything locally. It's just a browser that connects to cloud services. Kubernetes isn't even an OS in the traditional sense. It's an orchestration layer that manages containerized applications across entire server clusters. Virtualization changed everything. Hypervisors like VMware, KVM, and Hyper-V let you run multiple operating systems simultaneously on the same physical hardware. Each virtual machine thinks it has exclusive access to a computer, but really they're all sharing resources managed by the hypervisor. This revolutionized data centers, allowing one physical server to host dozens of virtual machines. Containers took it further. Docker and similar systems let you package an application with with all its dependencies into a single unit that runs identically everywhere. Unlike virtual machines, containers share the host OS kernel, making them incredibly lightweight. You can spin up a container in milliseconds instead of minutes. Cloud operating systems are distributed by nature. Your application doesn't run on one server. It runs across hundreds. If one server fails, the system automatically migrates your work to another. Load balancing distributes traffic across multiple instances. Autoscaling adds more servers when demand increases and removes them when demand drops. Level 7 systems introduce concepts like infrastructure as code. You don't manually configure servers anymore. You write code that describes what infrastructure you need, and the cloud platform creates it automatically. This makes deployments reproducible and scalable. The separation between OS and application has blurred. In serverless computing, you just upload your code and the cloud platform handles everything else. You don't even know or care what operating system is running underneath. These systems also represent a philosophical shift. Traditional operating systems assume you own your hardware. Cloud systems assume hardware is rented, ephemeral, and potentially anywhere in the world. Your data and applications live in the cloud, accessible from any device. This is where the operating system industry is headed. Multi-cloud deployments spanning AWS, Azure, and Google Cloud simultaneously. Edge computing bringing computation closer to users. Quantum operating systems managing quantum computers. The boundaries keep expanding. If you understand all seven levels of operating system evolution, from toggle switches to distributed cloud systems, you understand one of computing's most important journeys. You've seen how we went from million-dollar mainframes that required PhDs to operate, to computers in everyone's pocket, to computing infrastructure that spans the globe. That's the complete evolution of operating systems. Seven levels, seven decades, infinite innovation. Now go watch this next one. I guarantee you'll disagree with at least three of my rankings on the seven levels of internet.